Hello, I'm Michael Serkin, working at Red Hat. I'm the chair of the Virtio Technical Committee, which is a governing body that develops the Virtio specification. And now I'm going to tell you what we've been doing in the last year. First of all, the Virtio Technical Committee made some changes to its charter. One of the changes has to do with the scope of the Virtio specification, which originally was designed to only cover the interface between the driver, which is part of the guest running in a virtual machine, and device, which is part of the hypervisor on which it runs. Now, nowadays, there are multiple implementations which look differently. For example, there are hardware Virtio implementations, which can be used on bare metal systems or be passed through to a guest of a virtual machine but not be part of the hypervisor. There are nested setups where the device is part of the hypervisor but not part of the hypervisor on which the virtual machine runs. All of these cases are now declared in scope for the Virtio specification. The Virtio Technical Committee has been de facto registrar of device ID and feature bit numbers, and this has now been included in our charter. We have also made official our strong commitment to compatibility. In particular, any device or driver compliant with a specific version of the specification is sure to also be compliant with any future version of the specifications. We plan to release these future versions every 12 to 16 months. Finally, Cornelia Haag, which is a long-time contributor to the Virtio specification and the co-editor of the spec, working at Red Hat, is now a co-chair of the technical committee. Congratulations, Cornelia. It's easy to track changes made to the Virtio specification over time, because we maintain it, the history on GitHub. Looking at the change history historically, we can see that the rate of change has been stable in most of the recent years. You can only see a large spike around 2014, which is due to our work on the initial Virtio 1.0 revision during which we have imported and documented a large body of existing code. However, looking at the number of individuals contributing to the specification, we can see that this number has been growing steadily ever since Virtio 1.0 has been released in 2016. More than that, looking at the number of organizations involved in the Virtio specification development, we can see that this year is a record year. We have exceeded the number of organizations working on the Virtio specification that has been the previous record set in 2014. What drives these new contributors to work on Virtio? It turns out that for many of them, the reason is outside the cloud space, which is a traditional for Virtio. Instead, there are use cases that involve automotive, Internet of Things, mobile and other workloads. You will see this as I'm going to discuss some of the changes that have been made to the specification in the last year. Of course, I cannot list all of them, but just to give us some examples. I would like to start with the Virtio Sound device. And this is a new audio device supporting audio input and output. It is 
very useful for automotive and it is the largest single change made to the specification over the last year. The specification has been contributed by Aton Yakovlev working for Open Synergy. So, good job, Anton. Thank you, Open Synergy. The second largest change to the spec is documentation of the new Virtio memory device. Now, this one can be seen as a replacement for the balloon device. While the balloon device takes guest memory and passes it on to the host, kind of stealing it from the guest. The Virtio memory takes the opposite approach, adding host memory to the guest. This reversing of the roles turns out to be able to fix multiple issues in the traditional balloon device. Lots of thanks to David Hildenbrand at Red Hat who implemented this device and including the specification. GPIO is of course a general purpose input-output device which is widely used in embedded and Internet of Things configurations. Any of you who worked in such configurations are of course familiar with it, which is the reason that Viresh Kumar from Linaro added support for Virtio GPIO device to the specification. Next, System Control and Management Interface is a management interface present on ARM systems. It allows managing power, system state, sensor access, and more. Thanks to Peter Hilber from Open Synergy for adding this device to the specification. Free page hinting is not a new feature in that it has been suggested many times in the past. The idea is that guests can suggest areas of unused virtual machine memory to the host. By guest and host cooperating in this way, they can manage the memory of the virtual machine more efficiently. This sounds kind of simple, but it took many years to implement and even more time to document. Lots of thanks to Alexandra Duik for being persistent and including this in the Virtio specification while working for Intel. Virtio network devices are very popular. In the last year, support for UDP segmentation, which improves performance when transmitting packets from within the VM, as well as support for hash reporting, which improves performance when receiving packets in the VM has been implemented by Yuri Benditovich at Red Hat. Thank you very much. Additionally, Vitaly Mirenio at Marvel added support for flexible driver notifications. This enables support for hardware virtio offload devices developed by Marvel. Thank you, Vitaly. The I2C bus is of course very common and embedded and automotive systems, which is probably the reason 
that led Jai Deng from Intel to add support for Virtaio I2C to the specification. Over the last year, the Virtaio GPU gained the ability to export resources between devices as well as ability to pass blob resources. This has been developed by Gurchetan Singh and David Stevens while working at Chromium. The Virtaio file system gained over the last year support for the notification queue, which allows reporting asynchronous events from the server to the client. This work has been done by Stefan Hainochi at Red Hat. Thank you. And last, support for lifetime metrics for devices with limited lifetime, which are common, for example, in mobile systems, has been added to the Virtaio block device specification by Enrico Granata at Google. And there are more. So I cannot list you all. I'm very sorry, but thank you to all who contributed to the specification and to those that I did list. I have just mispronounced your name. Sorry about that. Also, thanks for all the viewers of the spec for their feedback. And of course, for developers who actually are implementing devices and drivers according to the spec. The work is driven by your experience. To those not directly working on Virtaio, Virtaio uses extending to new fields and drawing new contributors. So join us. Virtaio is easy to extend. A lot is going on. You can work on performance or you can work on new features. And with that, thank you very much. Hello, my name's Alex Bennett, and this is the Cremu Status Report. If you take 445 open source developers and you mix them together on a mailing list, this is what you get. But before we go into the details, I'd like to frame this by talking a little bit about me. So um, I've been hacking on Cremu for around about eight years. And that puts me in with about a quarter of the developers um, of the project that have experienced between five and 10 years. Uh, as you can see, we've got a fairly good mix. We've got people that have, uh, a fair number of people that have only been contributing for less than a year, up until the sort of hardcore 10% that have been working on this project for quite a long time now. I'm very lucky that I'm a paid developer uh, and Cremu is my main gig, but that makes me in common with the majority of the developers that work on Cremu. Only about a quarter of the um, contributors work in their spare time. Uh, the rest are doing this either full time uh, or as part of their um, main gig. Now I think it's time to talk about the event. So there's been one thing that's affected everyone in the world over the last couple of years, and that of course has been the global COVID pandemic. And I was interested to see if the effects of the rest of the world have had any um, changes on how we develop Cremio. So looking at the uh, developer survey that I sent out um, a couple of months ago, uh, I asked for people's uh, impression and the overwhelming majority of developers said that the um, pandemic had no very little direct impact on them. There was also a small percentage of people that said that given that they had more time to work on Cremu, it was an overall positive. Looking at the actual data itself, I plotted out the commits, although our raw commit data is fairly noisy, so I've had to average it out to make it a little bit smoother. And you can see for the duration of when the pandemic started, at the tail end of 2019, it's had very little effect. In fact, you might even notice a slight, slight upward tick in the total number of act, uh, total amount of activity in the project. 
However, there has definitely been one change in the way developers have worked over the last year, and that's been the switch to working from home. So we already had a fair number of people that you know did uh, a degree of home-based working when they were working on the project, but that has very much become the majority over the last year as work from home mandates have rolled out across the world. So now let's have a look at the releases and some of the key changes. So we seem to be keeping well up with our regular three releases a year cadence, and I don't see anything that indicates that that's going to change anytime soon. It seems to be working pretty well. So I did a plot as a word cloud of all the various uh, things that were mentioned in the sort of subject line of uh, the commits. And you can see, as you'd expect, all the major architectures. So we've got PowerPC, ARM, MIPS um, being, being mentioned in commit messages, as well as uh, subsystems such as the block subsystem, TCG, and stuff like that. It's also quite gratifying to see a lot of mention of, of testing. So that just gives you a sort of broad overview of the sort of areas that are seeing changes in the code base. But let's look at some more specifics. So one of the things that's improved is our support for encrypted guests. So this is currently AMD's secure virtualization technology. But I expect as other architectures catch up, we'll be seeing needs for support of this sort of thing um, in, in the future. In the block subsystem, uh, QCAL2 gains subcluster allocation, and this basically enables more efficient use of uh, QCAL2 backing files. Another big change is a full emulated NVMe controller. I believe there's another talk at KVM Forum where Klaus is going to talk about the history of that. And another section is the multi-process device emulation. So this is separating the emulation into a separate process, which has some uh, interesting security implications. And finally, ACPI hot plug is now the default, uh, default for um, PC-based architectures. As with uh, every other year, we have been involved in Google Summer of Code, uh, and this year we had uh, three contributors working on various parts of the code. So Lara worked on improving our um, virtualization emulation for the AMD processors, which have slightly different virtualization architecture. Nitesh worked on a terminal user interface, TUI, uh, for, that uses QMP to talk to QEMU to control it and Mahmoud uh, did some cache modeling using TCG plugins. There was another th um, bunch of students that worked uh, on Rust VMM projects, which uh, was done under the auspices of the Quemi project. So that included uh, Bogdan's work on mocking frameworks for VertIO queues, uh, Harsha Dartvarden's work on uh, integrating vhost user of VSOC with CATA containers, and then uh, Galen um, did some work on a vhost user uh, SCSI backend. Of course, aside from virtualization, QEMU is um, quite popular as an emulator. And this, this year we saw um, say goodbye to a number of targets, LM32, Moxie, TileGX, and Unicore32. I mean, as far as we could tell, not many people were using these architectures. Some of them had been deprecated from Linux, and it was getting increasingly hard to find binaries and toolchains to um, build tests. However, we did say hello to a new architecture, and that's the Hexagon DSP architecture from Qualcomm, which was added in the last year. Whilst we're on the subject of TCG, I thought I'd talk a bit about some lower level TCG updates. So we now have support, uh, support for split, um, writable and executable JIT buffers. So there's a, a mirror view of the bit uh, of the JIT, so you can generate into the writable portion and execute out of the executable portion. And this is something that helps with running on macOS on Apple Silicon. Uh, there's been improvements into the core TCG code with the way it handles constants. Uh, so again, allowing us to generate better backend code. A relatively recent addition was an improvement in the way that we handle breakpoints, uh, and this was triggered by um, a regression we found with Windows that for some reason generates uh, breakpoints into itself as it's booting up. So the new breakpoint handling is a lot more efficient and doesn't actually generate code that needs to be thrown away. Uh, and finally, the um, tiny code interpreter, which has always been the subject of deprecation requests, got a big update. So it was modernized to run all the latest uh, TCG code that is generated by the new um, vector, uh, vector operations and is now properly included in our CI so it shouldn't regress again.
Chromium is also very useful as a development target, so there's a number of things I thought I might mention here. So we now have the ability to capture USB packets in PCAP format, so you can monitor all the traffic between a guest and uh, a USB device, which gives you a good idea of what's going on between the two. The guest loader is a sort of companion to the generic loader, and it's uh, basically there to enable you to test uh, hypervisors, which expect to have a kernel and guest loaded into memory at the start and need some sort of pointer to it. We've continued to uh, enhance the GDB stub, so we've got small features like adding OSV support for Linux user, and also fancy features like reverse debugging, which builds on our existing record replay architecture to allow you to do things like reverse step and reverse debug. Um, TCG plugins are now enabled by default uh, anywhere where you have TCG uh, available. The runtime impact when no plugins are loaded is practically non-detectable and so it's useful to have the plugins uh, available if you want to do further analysis on your code without having to recompile the whole of Chromium. Uh, and finally there is the Chromium storage daemon which is your one-stop shop um, program for dealing with various block storages. On the internal side uh, there's been a, num a bunch of cleanup with things like uh, the accelerator being abstracted and TCG specific CPU ops being abstracted away and this is all in the purpose of making the Kremu build more flexible and allowing you to build Kremu with only a particular set of accelerators or with or without TCG support added in. Another area has changed is the um, common translator loop which is embedded in translator ops is now con convert, uh, completely converted so all um, guest architectures now use the common translator loop and which makes the management of that code a lot simpler and also allows them to use the other features. A while ago when we were doing SVE we did a big rewrite of the original Berkeley um, softload code and the main change of that was we were trying to get away from a bunch of magic constants and shifts to something that was easily followed and you could see um, the, the common way that so uh, floating point was handled. Well, that transition has now been completed with the 80-bit and 128-bit soft floats all being handled in the same core code. Finally, uh, there's uh, with and without default devices, and this is another build option that allows you to specify which devices you want to include in your build. So, say for example, you're building a KVM-only binary, you may not want to include a whole bunch of devices that are only used for emulation. On the process side, there's a couple of changes. Uh, we've joined the 21st century finally, and we now have a code of conduct. We've also continued with migrating more things to GitLab, which, which is now the canonical copy of our source code repository. So the bugs have migrated across, um, and that in includes a bunch of quality of life improvements. So for example, bugs get automatically closed when they're referenced in commits. More and more of our testing has moved across to GitLab. Uh, we still use Travis and Cirrus, but we're starting, we've done work to integrate the results from those into one place so you don't have to look at multiple uh, websites to see the state of a branch. As part of that, there's now also playbooks for adding shared workers. So this is part of our uh, drive to reduce the load on GitLab's own shared um, services that are used for all open source projects, and we can add specific architectures and have our own dedicated machines. Finally, um, Paolo talked about Meson last year, uh, and the Meson work has continued to evolve. Probably the biggest change has been adding, uh, reducing the number of tests that are done in the configure um, shell script and moving them into as native Meson tests. Um, finally, I'd like to talk about uh, the documentation. So last year we migrated everything to Sphinx. And now we have a new unified manual. So the manual includes all your system, user, tools, interoperability specs, as well as developer information in one nice searchable and browsable manual. Uh, it's also seems to have had a positive effect. So we've got about a net 10,000 new lines of documentation that have been added to the system. Right, let's quickly go through some of the developer awards and stats because I know what, that's what people are interested in. So most commits, Richard Henderson took it this year, um, just slightly ahead of Philippe. 
and he also keeps that if you look at most lines changed. I thought I'd also look at um, the who had the heaviest delete key. Uh, in my mind, uh, a commit that removes more lines than it adds is also a good commit because it's generally removing lots of cruft, and Marcus has been leading the charge on that side. Uh, finally, uh, with reviews, uh, there's been about 7,500 change sets, and I think we had about 7,700 reviews in total. So it's now fairly rare to find a commit that's not had at least one review before being merged. And Richard and Philip were very close side by side in having the most reviews. Uh, and finally, uh, I will just mention testers because sometimes, although we have uh, quite complete CI, you need to have. Uh, manual testing, actually build it and, and do stuff uh, on your own machine. And again, Philip has done the most of that. Right, with that, I will say thank you. Um, I've been Alex Bene. Uh, you can find me on Mastodon as under my handle of SD Squad, which is also the same handle I use on IRC. So uh, goodbye and hope you enjoy the rest of KVM Forum.